Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging Series, where we explore the experiences of individuals from the Black, Asian, and minority and ethnic communities. And you know, I say this every week and I'm gonna say it again this week, I've got a fascinating guest with us this week. And this week our guest is Mary Casapino Brewer. I hope I've said that um, properly. Um, and Mary is a due diligence manager at Imperial College. And she's got a really, fascinating story. So Mary, we just want to say a big thank you for um, joining us this week. Um, and what I'd like to start off by asking is, can you give us a sense of, of what it was when you were growing up, which gave you your sense of belonging, your sense of identity? Yeah, so firstly, I'd like to thank you, Wayne, for inviting me. To be honest, I'm quite nervous. I've told you this several times now, haven't I? So, um, and also that concept of sense of belonging is quite new to me. I've never really thought about that concept. Um, and when I spoke to my husband last night, I was like, I don't, it doesn't translate to Filipino, that word. Mm -hmm. But um, so in terms of childhood, so I, so I could just think about family and community. So when I say family, that's my immediate family and the extended family. So as a yeah. Filipino um, family, it's, it's, it's big. And mm -hmm. um, growing up in the Philippines, in the Southern Philippines, um, so we're quite close knit. So we, mm -hmm. uh, so my, there's my mom and my dad, and we, I've got two other sisters yeah. and my parents are, you know, like, where I guess they're, they're educated, so they yeah. they went to university. My grandparents, didn't. So my grandparents were um, hard workers. So I've I've got a, a, my grandparents on my father's side were farmers. So they right. were originally from the Middle Islands in the Philippines. Right. And in the 1930s, um, there's this big resettlement during the right. American colonization of the Philippines. Right. It's happened where they've resettled quite a lot of farmers to go on lands that hasn't been cultivated, you know, farmland. Right. So yeah. my grandfather were one of the first settlers. They moved to the Southern Island, which right. you know, it was a, a new thing in the 1930s. So they were farmers, they worked hard, they managed to send their three boys to school and university. Right. So, um, and my grandmother on my mother's side um, was a domestic helper. My yeah. mother worked as a, as a student through school, through university to, to finance everything. So, right. so growing up, there is that sense of, you know, to do well in life, you have to have a good education. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of, so that's family, in terms yeah. of community, um, where we're quite religious, we're Catholic. So yeah. growing up, we have this strong Catholic community. My friends mm -hmm. growing up were mainly from the church. Mm -hmm. And and also when, and school is a big, education was quite a big deal for us. So I was part of the good kids club, you might say. So I was good in academics and, you know, excelled and worked yeah. really hard. And, and when I was, and also quite active in like student union, you know, was a student mm -hmm. leader. Mm -hmm. And um, I sometimes say, yeah, I got lucky. I, I managed to, to get into a good university, but uh, you know, it's hard work. It was yes. to get into the best university in the Philippines, which is the University of the Philippines. You have to pass yeah. two entrance exams and yeah. it's only a handful of students who could go into the university mm -hmm. um, so it was a status symbol so when you mm -hmm. go into you can you have a degree from the university mm -hmm. of the philippines you must be quite good academically yeah. Yeah. and whether you're a rich kid or a poor kid you yeah. only you only need to pass the exam you don't you know other than that that was the only requirement so, so so, so was it? So your education was paid for. For it was, it was paid for um, once you'd passed those exams. Yes. Yeah, so right. Um, and it was, 
you know, it's very competitive because mm -hmm. it's government funded. Most universities in the Philippines would be, um, you know, privately owned. So it's mm -hmm. quite expensive. For, so my two other sisters went to a private university and my, I remembered my parents buying college plans. It's very American, but mm -hmm. instead of having like life insurance, you have like yeah. insurance for your kids' education. So when right. they... So they start paying it off when they were still like starting like early in their careers. And then yeah. as soon as the kids are old enough to go to university, they've got some money to Yeah, it's set aside for them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I was lucky enough to 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 get into the University of the Philippines. Everything's paid for. Yeah. And so in terms of so the education side, mm -hmm. because I stayed in academia after university, mm -hmm. I remained a researcher and everyone around me were like they all you know mm. want to do the masters their, PA, their mm. PhDs. so it was like a route that well I'll, I'll just take that I'll, I'll do that as well so I applied to several universities and then I was um then lucky enough to yeah. to get a full scholarship to study in Thailand and right. I did the masters in food engineering you know at that time there's no such things as like student loans you know right. like here if you, yeah. you you have you want to pursue your degree or your postgraduate degree you could go to the bank and then you know get some money out and then you know pay it yeah. later on there's no such thing as that in the philippines yeah and the only way for you to do it is either you've got parents who's got money or yeah. you've got money yourself you've got savings which at that time yeah. you know i just finished university i didn't really have a you lot didn't of money. Have any, yeah yeah so the only option for me is to find studentships and so yeah. i i got a full scholarship i was able to they paid for my international flights, living yeah. expenses, you know, there's some book allowances for two years. So I was in Thailand, I did my degree and my, my master's there. And one thing that was quite lucky when I was in Thailand, the university where I went to is multicultural international. Right. So at 23, I was mm -hmm. in this beautiful campus in the outskirts of Bangkok with, you know, like professors from all over the world, classmates from places I've never really heard of, like Bhutan, or like I have friends from Tibet, from Kazakhstan, yeah. to, you know, like Europeans, Americans, yeah, and also a very strong Filipino community. Yeah. And it was really the first time in within my family who, who's got someone who managed to go overseas to study, not to work. Yeah. So not as, yeah. I was going to ask you because the, the journey which you've already kind of like described from your grandparents who had been settled into a new area um, the kind of like the migration, the movement, it sounded as though you're the first one who had actually been able to voluntarily or willingly say, well, I want to go and see somewhere else. Could I just ask a little bit about your, your sisters? Because you said that you were the one who got the full scholarship, but your sisters, your parents had a kind of like a payment plan for them, a university. How did, how did that translate for them? Did they, in terms of, um, their experiences of university and, and kind of like that added expense, as it were, which they po possibly had compared to your experience, do you think? So I guess at that time, it was just what you do. So as right, soon okay. as you become a parent, mm -hmm. so I guess we moved, you know, from being, you know, farmers and workers, mm -hmm. we, we became like middle class because my parents managed yeah, to go to university at that time and yeah. it was just I guess the route that if you can't get scholarship to study your mm -hmm. parents will have to pay oh, for it so, right. yeah. Yeah. so it was it it's an expensive you know mm -hmm. um undertaking for someone who's a parent because you would need to make sure you've got you know otherwise there's no future for you there's always that yeah. Yeah. If you don't finish university there's no future for you. So you have right. to finish university. But I guess the difference is, so both of my, the two sisters went on to study engineering. So my dad's an engineer, right. they went to study engineering. And one of my sisters actually um, became an electrical engineer, the same as my dad. So, right. okay. um, and you know, like it was, it was a given. It wasn't really mm -hmm. a big issue that I, I was a scholar and they weren't. It was yeah. just like, we all finished university and my parents were very happy because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's an achievement for them yeah, um, yeah. To, to be able to do that for their kids. 
That's, I, I find it really fascinating, the fact that your grandparents worked in the fields, but they valued the, the, the um, education and supported your parents um, to go. And they did exactly the same thing for you um, in terms of, and then you spread your, your wings a bit and no longer just stayed in, in the Philippines, but went across to Thailand. So in Thailand, you're mixing with all of these different individuals from across the world. How did that make you feel? I know you said you had a, a, quite a large Filipino community there, but how did that make you feel about the world around you and how you, where you belonged within that, as it were? Yeah, so that's a really interesting, you know, like that experience I had, I was there for seven years. Right. It, it was very formative, I guess, for me, because I was 23 when I first got there. Yes. You no, know, that was my first overseas trip essentially yes. first flight like international flight i got on got <laughs> landed to thailand like, completely like although people might think oh it's southeast asia you all look the same they think i'm thai anyway but yeah. the language was completely different the script that they use completely i can't read any of the script I, I got down i got on the taxi to the university you see you know like they 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 have a royal family and the philippines doesn't really have a royal you know there's yeah. no yeah. Um, um, royal and all that. So that was all new to me. And and but the whole seven years, it was grounded with like realization, like the world is so much bigger than where I was from in the southern Philippines, in that really, yeah. really small city. And you know, it's it's sometimes I I I you know like it's a really sometimes like I'm like well, I'm very lucky to have those all those experiences. And, and also in Thailand, so whilst I was doing my master's, although it's all fully paid for, I thought, no, I could earn some more. I was very active, you know, in terms of like the cultural stuff. I was organizing cultural events for students um, because I did my master's for two years. There's quite a lot of like, I didn't really like the degree. I was working in the lab, but I liked the non academics like the social okay. stuff. <laughs> and on weekends, I, um, if you go to Thailand, there's a lot of Filipinos and they always tell you, they always ask you, are you an English teacher? So, you know, it's, it's so if you go to like, if you come to a hospital here, they'll say, are you a nurse? So, yeah. so in Thailand, the stereotype is you're a Filipino, you're an English teacher. And I said, yeah. well, I'm not, I'm not, I, I came here to study, but actually on the weekends, I was teaching English. Right. But that's how I met my husband, who's right. was traveling at that time, and you know, he, he's British, and then he, he was teaching English while he was traveling. So yeah. that's how we met. And yeah, and yeah but Thailand, you know, like the, it was such a an experience. Food, you know, completely different. And also being in on that international campus where just meeting people like you, I wouldn't have, you know, like I wouldn't have really thought like these people exist as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah. in the Philippines, it's, it's it's just, yeah, the world is really my oyster. If I, you know, it opened quite a lot of possibilities. I could just be anyone I want because, you know, there's just limitless, the possibility. So, so so within that, that, within that time of you arriving in the Thailand, it was, it was quite life-changing. Thailand was quite Definitely. life changing for you. Because you, 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 you spoke about the fact that it was your formative years. You, you were just kind of like entering adulthood, as it were. You just finished your first degree. Um, you were meeting so many other people. You ended up meeting the person who would then be your life partner, your husband. So it was, it was a real melting pot of things happening to you at that particular time. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, with all of that, so what made you then decide, other, other than what made you decide to come to the UK and how is how is that transition from Thailand um, or from Philippines to Thailand to the UK, what comparisons can you make from, from those different experiences? So, well, it was mainly circumstances that's brought me to the UK because yes. my husband, at that, you know, we were, you know, early in our relationship. And then he was mm -hmm. saying, well, I want to go back to the UK. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, there's an option for me. I could still go, you know, look for PhD studentships. And, you know, I, I thought it was 
easier to, to do it that way. You know, become a student and then you know get a job yeah. and that's how we do it. And it wasn't, as it turned out, I wasn't yes. I wasn't considered a home student. There were mm -hmm. two universities who gave me admissions with the condition to say, you don't have funding, so you need to find funding for yourself. But it wasn't yeah. like, you know, we can't afford it. I couldn't afford I couldn't yeah. afford it. So it so that went like, no, that's not an option. So mm -hmm. we got married in 2010. Mm -hmm. We decided to stay in London. So my husband's from London. He's got family here. Mm -hmm. um, and it that transition wasn't as, you know, it wasn't difficult because my husband's also from a family who's very close knit. Mm -hmm. um, his his mum's Irish has got a very, you know, that, that family yeah. orientated upbringing is there. And we're very lucky. They're only like five minute walk from us. And it's, right. you know, we've got, We've yeah. got that covered in terms of childcare at the moment, but it's it's that that transition is isn't you know it, it was smoother than I was you know I, I thought it would be a bit more difficult, but yeah. but it was the I guess at the early earlier period of like an uncertainty of will I get a job will I get yeah. a proper job or or will I just have to be um, working part time all the time will because you know I I don't know what's it like working in the UK? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and and that, um, you know, that rejection about doing a PhD was something I didn't really think about mm -hmm. until I guess, you know, in a conversation two days ago when you said, yeah. you know, how did you feel about that? Yeah, um, yeah I, it's, sometimes it comes to my mind where like, if I did my degree here, it would have been different. Yeah. You know, I worked hard to get my degree as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's what, uh, it, it's um it wasn't easy yeah but because of my i don't have the right paperwork i suppose um yeah. i couldn't do i couldn't, couldn't do the phd and get funding and 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 do that that route to, of my career if if you know yeah. if if that happened that would have been a, an option but obviously now it's 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 gone completely on the other well, side it's not gone completely because what I, I wanted to explore i wanted to explore something with you just after what you were just saying in the fact that um education definitely seemed to be something which was ingrained in you from a very young age from what your parents so for you it seemed as though part of the natural progression you'd done your degree you'd done your master's you were intentionally looking to do a phd yeah but then the barrier whereas in in the Philippines, you got a scholarship. In to go to Thailand, you got a scholarship. And then when you came to the UK, it was kind of like almost, um, for, for want of a be better word, it was almost like payback time because all of the <laughs> <laughs> you got all free education. Now it's time to pay for it. <laughs> well, at that time, I explored options for like student loans. I know people can get student loans. You know, my husband, uh, you know, said that to me, and I was like, well, I don't have the citizenship yet mm -hmm. to get a student loan so that wasn't an option so I think at that time it was just like I need to get some money in you know I yeah. need to earn some income yeah. which then you know that where you know for how my career went it's probably yeah. a better option for me because at the end of the day when I did my master's when I was doing my degree I didn't like the lab work you know I know people you know work in the lab and stuff and <laughs> yeah they're quite passionate about that but I think um, it's it's not for me, you know, working okay. in the lab. So that was probably the right decision to take. Because <laughs> if I had a PhD, I probably would have to had to get to stick to it. <laughs> well, not necessarily. It opens up other doors. So yes. it would, so and and although you you may not be a um, that you would do a PhD necessarily in the labs, it may be that you may want to think about doing. Uh, PhD more related to kind of like the role which you're doing now. So tell us a little bit about um, what you're actually doing now, the kind of job and how you feel within that job um, that you're doing. Yeah, so I guess to to get to where I am now, I have yeah. to like, let you know, how I, the, the whole process. So yeah. when I, the first job that I, I got when I went, I came to the UK was a project mm -hmm. administrator um at Brunel University so I did that for two years yeah I didn't know anything about the UK funding landscape so as a project administrator I wasn't doing any lab work it was not nothing related to research when I was mm -hmm. in Thailand I was doing a bit of project admin research mm -hmm. admin work and mm -hmm. research 
So that was quite, you know, that was my like, comfort zone. You know, I know the research and I know uh, it's writing papers. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Uh, moving to the UK was everything was just, I was work like racing purchase orders and, you know, doing all the fine budgeting and basic budgeting and, and, and finance stuff, which, and also looking at the, the UK research, you know, th that whole area, which new to, which is new to me. Like I've not, I don't know anything about full economic costings, for example, the basics mm -hmm. of it all. And, but I had a very supportive line manager and she was right. like, you've got this opportunity to, to, you know, network and build, build that network in, in the UK. And I did one of the things that I, um, I completed was the Springboard Women Development Programme. And that was right. in 20, um, so 2011, it's so years mm -hmm. ago. And that really helped me become a bit more confident in like in myself and like getting to know people. So that two years, although it's only two years, I'm still in yeah. touch with my line manager. She's she's been really one of my heroes in terms of the career in research administration. Could, could you just um, expand upon just very briefly um, what you felt that you got from that springboard? program which you went on what, what were the key skills that, that that it helped you to develop especially being new into the role etc just give us a little inkling of what that was so it's being active so if you're mm -hmm. so just being active in you know like you you work and you, you feel it's it's that term of belonging as well like if you belong mm -hmm. into something and you invest in in it and you feel mm -hmm. like this is what i'm going to be doing and i like what i'm doing you you invest your time and effort so it wasn't like i just went into work did my nine to five and that was it so i was very i was quite proactive in mm -hmm. so that network with all like because we're all early career Mm -hmm. um like women early career in in that group we have a network about seven of us and we mm -hmm. met quite regularly and just talking about our jobs and you know what what we would like be, to be doing and within those two of the people i was in that in that cohort with ended up having like um promotions and and you know they were telling me about courses they've been on and just getting because at that time i don't didn't know anyone yeah. I just didn't yeah. know. I don't have that. You know, I'm yeah. quite. I, you probably can tell. I'm quite. You know, I'm quite extrovert and. Yeah. But not having that base and not having, like, no one really knew me. Yeah, was, that's right. Was that, that was the grounding. That was quite mm -hmm. a good base for me. Um, and after two years, so I went. Um, I got a job at um, UCL as research coordinator at the Institute for Global Health. So I was at UCL for almost eight years, and that was I, I really love that job mm -hmm. it's, it's very dynamic one thing that i did in that job was i i think that was i made the decision that this is the job that i want i'm not going to pursue any phds anymore okay. it's um research administration is such mm -hmm. a broad you know broad area yeah if there is only a master's or a PhD in research management, I would have probably taken it. There is actually in the US, but there yeah. is a, in the UK. Yeah. So that's when, that's when I found out about the Association of Research Managers and Administrators. Right. ARMA is, a, you know, that they, they helped me, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of networking. I did quite a lot of courses with them. I. I convinced my department, my head of department, to pay for my membership fee yeah. to, to join ARMA because I know, oh, if you're an economist, you join all these, you know, you join yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. association. Why can't yeah. I join an association? Yeah, um, yeah. To better myself and to be yeah. able to be good at to be good at what I do. So, um, and also I was, you know, from the springboard, I I said to myself, I need to be active. I was actively looking for funding. I'm right. very good at looking for funding. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah. funding for my own development. So I managed to get an Erasmus um, professional staff exchange. So not everyone knows about this because yeah. they think, oh, Erasmus is just for, um, it's an exchange program for technical academic, yeah. you know, or students. Yeah. yeah. But there is actually an exchange program for professional services staff. Right. So I, I got funding to to go to Sweden in one of our partners, Umia University, yeah. and 
job shadow another research coordinator who's doing exactly like a bit more experienced than me so i was you know um finding out how you know how he does his job and yeah. that was really insightful and through arma i got some bursaries so i did a course on helping research partners build their financial management capacity i'm not an accountant mm -hmm. my husband is so yeah. but i i need to I, I said to myself i need to learn these things yeah. so so quite a lot of the stuff that i did were all free you know i could yeah. say that but yeah. it's available but it's not easy to find so yeah then later on in my career at ucl i became a mentor you know i was a mentee i became a mentor and i set up the, a network of research support administrators because okay. i said to myself if there was just one when i when i was early in my career it would have been so much easier for me yeah. to develop yeah. this career yeah. uh, because it's not an easy route to develop yeah. if you don't have experience it's really difficult to go up that ladder yeah um so within that network i made sure that you know you, it's it's really getting to know people around you that's mm -hmm. very important and i mm -hmm. think all throughout that period it's it shaped me on like mm -hmm. you know going to imperial i wouldn't have been able like, you know my line manager now would say this i wouldn't have been able to get that this job now without those experiences, those experiences. Yeah. yeah but it sounds i hear that but you sound to be me to be very um proactive a bit of an explorer yeah you're you're not um necessarily satisfied with the, the status quo you have to be doing something am, am i right in that i think yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it sounds as though from, from listening to you um it's kind of like i'm going to go you say you're extroverted i, I would agree with that but i also think that you want to discover there's a there's an element of you want to see more than what you have currently so in terms of the establishing of that network which you did what would you say was the major impact that that had on yourself and on your colleagues and on their sense of belonging their sense of identity within the organization yeah so i was saying about research administration research management that's a very broad career you can't yeah. really define it as oh that's what 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 do you do? And someone asked me, like, what do you actually do? And you're like, yeah. oh, I'm helping someone book a flight to India, or I'm, I'm, I'm looking at budgets for a research project, or I'm, you know, I'm buying stationery for for a project or lab supplies. And then you're like, well, I'm doing quite a lot of things. But within the umbrella, you're actually supporting research projects to be yeah. delivered successfully. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the and and although it is all over the place, there is actually mm -hmm. a system to it. And that mm -hmm. network, to, the, when I left UCL, there was about 235 members. And that was mm -hmm. grassroots network. So it wasn't, because there wasn't centrally, there wasn't really a push for it because they yeah. think, they said, oh, you're, you know, you are administrators working in the departments. It's, you know, you do different types of jobs. Yeah. But I said, well, there's core to what we do, which is supporting research projects. Yeah. And there's got a lot of, you know, sharing best practices was one of the things that people have always said to me. If mm -hmm. only I knew how to do this, you know, yeah. if only someone could show me. I yeah. know someone else in another department could yeah. was doing this, you know, like yeah. I've been doing it. I don't have to reinvent the wheel or something. So just sharing those and also organizing, you know, lunchtime seminars on on topics like full economic costings, the, the research funding landscape, you know, those mm -hmm. big, big headlines that we only read about because, you know, or like, oh, a research income is this and what does it actually mean for our yeah. job, like our day to day job. So yeah. and to explain to that level of, well, this is your role, you're supporting this. So you are, you belong to the organization. Yeah. And you, you find that you are also important and and that bigger picture stuff quite a lot most of the time it's not being talked about in you know you're just an administrator why do you need to know about the bigger picture well, the, the, the fact that you just asked that question you it's almost like you've asked the question which i was going to ask you right <laughs> because it, it's that idea that people think 
or they're just an administrator. But you, the way that you've explained it to me just now, it's so much more than just kind of like there. It's an you're just an administrator. It's not just an administrator. It's it's kind of like, for want of a better word, it's like the glue which is holding everything together without your input and without you connecting the necessary dots and, and, and threading everything together, everything else can't be sustained. Am I right in that? Yes, no, definitely. And we all, we are all part of something. And hmm. I remember my husband saying last night, like belonging, if you belong, you are part of something and you are, yeah. so you yeah. are, you know, if there's a, a whole cake, you're a slice of that. And that cake yeah. is, Whole, if there's there isn't that slice yeah. yeah you might be like a you know in in a bigger university like imperial with yeah. a billion pounds of um um turnover probably we're probably that but we're, we are still part of it you know it's not yeah. going to be a whole cake without us so yeah. it um and because you know there is there is that career path like although there is no undergraduate degree in research management, mm -hmm. you can actually still develop that skill. So you could have a finance background or, you know, my background is, you know, um, fisheries and food engineering. How did I end up doing due diligence at Imperial? So, you know, my, my, my peers, you know, my friends have got PhDs in like post harvest fisheries, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and they're doing that. They work in the lab. I'm like, explaining to them like what do I do and they're like huh like how did you even end up doing that? <laughs> but, but you I, I suppose the, the question of for me I can already hear that you've got a passion for what you do yeah and it sounds to me as if you had the opportunity to to do some kind of like professional qualification which would recognize the landscape which you're operating in, that you would you would do that. Am I, am I right in saying that? Yeah, so I did. So there is mm -hmm. now, finally, Arma had, um, there is a professional qualification in research management. So I was right. actually one of the first ones who did, it, were part of the, like, the first cohort. Um, so it what it's recognized by the sector that it is yeah. important because people are now thinking, you know, like it's, when you apply for jobs and you see these roles and you're like, what does that actually mean? You know, yeah. and, and that question could be answered by if you've got a clear job description and, you know, we've got job titles that are, you know, if you're like, you're a postgraduate researcher, that's very clear now because we understand mm -hmm. what that means. But if you're like a research administrator or a research support staff, what, what? do you mean yeah. by that? Yeah. But ARMA is trying to make it so that it's standardized and you know there is there is now a professional qualification that you could go on and i can't i think cardiff university just this is before pandemic so i don't know actually i have to check this again i think they they were trying to do a professional masters in research management i know though in america there is there is postgraduate degrees in research administration research yeah. management they're quite ahead in terms of of that professional qualification so it's so much easier to like but yeah. then you don't you know ask someone you know like i've got a 16 year old nephew and like do you want to do do you want to become a research support manager <laughs> or something like that? that's not some, that's not a career that you probably will ask someone as young as 16 to like do you want to take that career on so mm -hmm. it's still quite a long way but you know, we're getting there in terms of like recognizing yeah. that there is there is a qualification. Uh, it's professional. It's yeah. a professional um, role. OK, so I'm, normally at this time, it's just on one o'clock. I'd, I'd ask and see if there's any questions which anyone in the audience would like to ask. If you have, just raise your hand or or come on, cam come on camera and, and ask your question. If not, I've still got a few more um, questions which I'd like to explore with you. I'll give a few minutes. If anything comes up, you can either put it in the chat or, or just um, raise your hand. So thinking about the fact that I'm just going back again to, we've spoken about your, your job situation and, and everything. Um, and you also spoke briefly about the, the family dynamics here in the UK in terms of your husband's family. Now, what about in terms of, you said that you settled in, what about like 
you said that your husband is 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 in from the UK, um, and you have children. How do you maintain their sense of identity and their sense of belonging to your Filipino side of the family? Because it's part of who you are, so it's part of who they are. So, mm. so if you don't mind, and then we'll see. Yeah. So it is. It's it's a big part of who I am now as a parent, mm. uh, like a mother. Like I guess my identity now. I'm a mother. Yeah. I'm I'm from the Philippines originally, and I'm also British now. So that's my identity. Mm -hmm. So um, it's such a shame with pandemic because mm -hmm. I did manage to bring my daughter to the Philippines when she was ten months old, but she was too young to really see. You know, she we would show a picture, and she was like, "Oh, I've been to the beach. I want to go to the beach again," and you know all that stuff. But Lately, so she's turning four in June. So she's in that stage where she asks quite a lot of questions. One day we were going, dropping her off to nursery. She said, she asked me, so mommy, how did you end up coming to my home? So she thinks London is her home, but I'm from the Philippines. So how did I end up being in London? That's her home. Because yeah. she speaks, you know, with the pandemic, like when parents were, have been here, but they were, you know, she was still little. Um, so they speak quite a lot on, like on 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 Zoom and stuff, or, um, you know, on WhatsApp, but mm -hmm. she hasn't seen them since she was like, mm -hmm. now that she can actually you know, remember quite a lot of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. But one thing that lockdown, you know, the advantages of lockdown is we spent quite a lot of time with her. And on the Fridays, I do, I did, I, I made it into like a Filipino Friday. Yes. So I made sure that we do like at least one Filipino related activity on a Friday, be mm -hmm. it reading a book, um, mm -hmm. you know, a Filipino book. And, um, and I don't know if people know about this. So the Philippines has, has got one, apparently, like I Googled this, so I was like, how many languages have we got? Like 175 spoken languages. So I speak three different um, languages, Filipino languages, but, yeah. um, but Tagalog, which is the main language in the Philippines, is, is quite, um, you know, it's widely spoken, but English is, you know, we're the fifth, largest English speaking, you know, country in the world. So mm -hmm. you, in, you can get away with, you know, not, not knowing Filipino um, and travel around the Philippines. But I want to make sure that she feels, yeah, she knows about her Filipino culture, you know, through books, through crafts. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite, and that's really because of lockdown. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've had this realization that I'm like, I don't speak Filipino to her. I don't speak Tagalog or the two other dialects that I'm, I can speak with and when my parents phone her they all speak in English because they want to speak in English you know like and so I was teaching her Filipino nursery rhymes you could watch it on YouTube you know some of those but the books were quite I thought you know I'm quite passionate about children's books anyway mm -hmm. I bought they're quite expensive I bought children's mm -hmm. books from the Philippines I had it shipped all over uh, you know it shipped here mm -hmm. and yeah so we maintain that you know, I, I'm hoping that I will be able to maintain that mm -hmm. Filipino Friday activities yeah. with her because yeah. I, I don't want her to lose it because she she is Filipino, you know, she mm -hmm. is, it's part of her, it's part of me and she knows, mm -hmm. you know, she would say like, why is your hair black? And you know, all those things like, and then yeah. your skin's bra darker than me, you know, she's, yeah. she, she's already at that stage of quite inquisitive yeah. about the differences and, um. And the language as well is quite important. That's, you know, I, I'm hoping she would learn some Filipino words through nursery rhymes at least. Yeah. And yeah. she could, um, and it's always fun anyway to, to show it to my family and like, oh, she's, she's singing a, a Tagalog nursery, nursery rhyme. <laughs> so yeah, so they're, they're quite happy with that. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. I, I, I really like that. And I, it's very important that that connection is continued um, uh, and that, that she recognizes and values both parts of her identity. Uh, it's, as she get older, I suspect um, she needs, or she'll have to kind of like come to her own realization of the importance of who she is um, mm. in the same way that, that you have. Um, 
there was someone who put, uh, I think this kind of like relates to, to what we had said, which was, have you managed to keep um, your international connect connections from, from Thai your days in Thailand and even yeah. you, your connections to the Philippines as well? Yeah, so um, before the pandemic, we managed to, to go to Thailand. You know, Thailand's always been our second home. I always have that, you know, with my husband, I always say, don't we have a fallback? We could always go back to Thailand. It's, um, you know, they, they became my lifelong friends. It's it's one of those things that you you build that relationship. It's There was a really close Filipino community in the university. So, you know, I, you know, we, we still keep in touch and there's even like, we do caroling for Christmas and we, we did it on Zoom, you know, because a lot of people have moved out yeah. um, are in Canada, in the US, you know, all over the world. So, yeah. you know, they 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 managed to gather us together. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if there's, every time we go back to Thailand, we always go back to the university. It's just mm -hmm. in the outskirts. Um, you know, if, if you look it up, Asian Institute of Technology is the the university to go to there's there's an olympic size swimming pool you know all the mod cons it's it's yeah. it's really nice international restaurants and stuff yes it sounds brilliant <laughs> <laughs> we've got another um question from dion and um, which says i find mary's story very inspiring i would be interesting interested to know if there is a research management stroke um administration society at imperial too and if not mary would you would you be a great leader we're coming back to something which you had told me previously that all of your friends always saw you as the leader right and here yeah. we, we see that someone's pushing you forward to to potentially do you know if there's a research management administration um so as far as i know so i work in the central research office that's actually one of the things that i i i've um, you know, when they, when I did my interview, that was one of the things that like, was the highlight, like, you know, this research support network is one of the things probably we will, we will need in yeah. the college. So yeah. yeah, we, I am, it's part of the, the things that I, I'll be doing. So it's, um, um, and another colleague who's joined from UCL as well. It's, it's, it's one of those, it's part of like the communities of practice. It's, it's, um, there's quite a lot of stuff going on, but mm. we are exploring different different you know um areas of how how we can do this because there is there is a need of just even sharing best practices um yeah. it might not be as formal as like you know having like a network yeah. but um but even like a teams group there is there is definitely a need and yeah so those are one of the things you know because it, when the pandemic happened it was just like oh a lot of the stuff that i was supposed to be doing was just put in the back burner because yeah. other things come up and yeah. and priorities change but yes I, this interview really reminded me the importance of you know networking and yeah. it's and some it's something that i've learned i think it was from the, the springboard it's mm -hmm. anything that you if if you want something out of uh, if you want to get something out of a network or the community you need to give give something yeah, back give like yeah. yeah you need to put in something you need to yeah. invest in it to be able to to take take from it mm -hmm. you know so um and i've yeah. always been grateful for the mentors that i've had throughout the years and you know people mm -hmm. The people I, who I've contacted, you know, through emails, and then they said, yeah, we can meet and talk about my, you know, like, career and, you know, all that. And I feel like, wow, they spent time, like, accommodating yeah. me. And, you know, yeah. and if then I've had people contacting me, and then, you know, I, I just say, you know, it's just I'm, I'm paying it back yeah. for, for all that. Yeah. But you, you do do a lot of mentoring, don't you? Or, yes. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Because you, you've done... Um, can you explain some of the, the, the you really kind of like highlighted why you do the mentoring what has been some of the um how can i put it the high points what do you get from the whole mentoring process and why would you recommend it to others yeah so i guess because you know you've heard how i started like i didn't know i didn't know anyone i didn't know anything you mm -hmm. know like it's um the uk the, the whole funding area, you know, the, the research, the research area is, 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 is completely new to me. So I needed, at first I needed to know where I'm, 
I I want to be in terms of the career path. And mm -hmm. so through that, so so firstly, I've mentioned about springboards. Mm -hmm. You know, early in my career, that was quite important because mm -hmm. that's how I've learned to be confident that it's okay. You can actually contact people. You know, you if you're if you want to know what their career is like, you know, people are very helpful if you yeah. if you just ask them. And yeah. and also through Arma, that whole there they've got a mentoring scheme. And at the moment I'm mentoring two two um colleagues and um and I I was a mentee as well all throughout that you know period and mm -hmm. and and because I my quite a few of my mentors are also working outside like when I was at UCL they're not in at UCL so they, they, it's just given me the, the perspective like different perspective yeah. so they yeah. don't know me you know they don't know how I work but you know yeah. they, they've got insights that um it's it's really broadened you know like one thing that I've realized is you can be you know research support is the best job you could you know you, you could have because you could be anywhere you yeah. know you could be you know if you move I've got a friend who's moved to Scotland and she said, oh, I've got a job in the University of Edinburgh because, you know, it's transferable. You know, whatever we did at UCL, is just, you know, it might be a different system, but it's the it's basics a... of it are the same. So you yeah. move to, you know, when I, what I was doing in Thailand, the basic stuff that I was doing, supporting a project is the yeah. same. The yeah. systems are different, you know, the funding landscape is different and, you know, it's an international funding landscape, not like the full economical states, you know, all those things are different, but the yeah. actual basic stuff's the same. But it's it's that willingness to learn as well. Mm -hmm. It's 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 quite important, and I think not not burning bridges is one yeah. thing that don't burn bridges. You yeah. know, make sure you you main, maintain those um, mm -hmm. connections. Brilliant. You know what? I, I say this at the end of each interview. I'm I'm ashamed. I'm sad that we have to finish because there's so much more that I know that we could go into. But um, you had no need to be nervous because I knew your life story. I knew your story was going to be brilliant, and it, it's turned out to be even better. So I want to just say a really big thank you. But before I ask. Before I, I we we say goodbyes, I just want to ask one final question, and that is, what advice would you have given to your younger self as to where you would end up or, or how they can get to where they want to get to in the future? Oh, just I think it's not really you know don't change, just be yourself. You know, like it's um you. The world is not as scary as I thought it was. <laughs> you know, when I was 23 on my own, going to Thailand on the first international flight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it isn't. It's, you know, if you just be yourself, you don't have to pretend to be anyone else. You know, you, you, you just, just be yourself. I love that. I love that. That, that that echoes the idea of authenticity you need to know who you are and be yourself in whatever situation and i can see that you're i would love to meet you in person a bubbly interview a bubbly person well, i know we could just sit down and chat <laughs> You know, you can teach me some some words from the Philippines. It would be absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, if ever you want to go to the Philippines or go to Thailand, you know, I'm yeah. I'm just a team's message away. <laughs> okay, brilliant. <laughs> it's been really great having you on, Mary. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm waiting to hear about this um this um administration network which you're going to be setting up very soon okay and um, because i can see that you're doing some great stuff already and there's so much more to come so another really big thank you i'm just gonna let people know what's going to be happening next week um, and then we will um, be able to move on so next week we're going to have amber lee um, Amber Lee Green, and she is a, a mental health advisor, stroke researcher, facilitator, illustrator, um, living in London. Um, and it's to go in line with next week, which is the Mental Health Awareness Week. So please um, join us and um, come for that interview as well. 
If you haven't been able to see some of the in other interviews, please go to our um, YouTube channel, um, which is at tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO. And you'll be able to see the other um, videos in this series. And I'd just like to say once again, Mary, a really big thank you for um, coming and being with us, being our guest today. And I will see everybody again next week. And thank you all so much for, for, for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.